Bueno, bueno. ¿Me escucha? Ah, ok. Este, bueno, muchas gracias por, por asistir al, al coloquio eh, Jorge Flores del día de hoy. Este, tengo el gusto de, de presentarles al doctor Colin Brojol. Él este, hizo su, su doctorado en la Universidad de Copenhague, se graduó en mil, 1988. De ahí eh, trabajó un par de años en los laboratorios Bell y después de eso se, se mudó a, a este, o bueno, se fue contratado en, o, o desarrolló su carrera en, el, este, en la John Hopkins University. Y bueno, tiene una carrera muy prolífica en el área de de difracción, dispersión de neutrones a, aplicada a la, a la materia condensada y, a la, y al área de magnetismo. Y bueno, pero sin, sin más dilación, pues, pues lo, lo, lo dejo en, en el uso de la palabra. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Uh, gracias uh, por esa introducción. Uh, y ya que demostró que sí hablo español, uh, voy a transicionar a hablar inglés porque el español es más uh, de casera <ríe> y realmente no estoy tan bien en el profesional. Uh, pero Espero mejorar en ese, as, uh, en ese asunto um, mientras que estoy aquí uh, durante dos meses uh, en ese verano. Y I'd like to start by really thanking uh, Arturo very much for the opportunity to visit uh, the, uh, UNAM and the Physics Institute. Uh, it's really a tremendous uh, pleasure for me. Um, it turns out that my wife is Mexican, and so for many years I've been coming to Mexico City, but I've never had any kind of po professional engagement, and, and so this is my opportunity, and I'm looking forward to get to know Uh, many of you in the department, um, and I'm hoping that in the course of my sabbatical visit, uh, we'll be able to develop collaborations and, and really uh, uh, extend and, uh, the, uh, the connections between uh, UNAM physics and physics at, at Johns Hopkins University, where I've uh, been working uh, for quite a while. Okay, so, uh, so the, uh, the title of my talk today is Quantum Fluctuations on Triangular Lattices of Ising Spins. And, um, and I say that uh, the, I'd like, what I'm really wanting to tell you about uh, is our experimental um, work in what we call quantum magnetic materials. Um, and what I mean to say about that is that uh, we are looking at materials where quantum fluctuations, quantum entanglement, uh, quantum coherence uh, really influences the physical properties of the materials. We know that magnetism ultimately is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. But we are trying to look at quantum fluctuations and quantum effects on the longer length scales. So it turns out that neutron scattering uh, is a really wonderful technique to probe uh, magnetic materials. Um, and so I'm going to uh, try to introduce this technique um, uh, through this uh, presentation. So even though there will be sort of a main topic, which will be the triangular lattice uh, um, Uh, Ising magnetism, I'm trying in the talk to give kind of a broader view of the motivations that we have for this kind of work, and also to talk about the experimental technique uh, that we use, um, and the kind of way that we think about the magnetism of materials, um, and how we try to understand uh, these uh, kind of quantum physics effects. Um, all right, so let me jump straight into it then. Uh, and uh, as, of, as in many of my uh, scientific um, uh, projects, they always involve certain chemical materials, uh, certain single crystalline materials typically. And in this case, we're going to look at specifically these uh, two materials. Uh, these were actually introduced to us by Bob Carver, who is a solid state chemist at Princeton University that I've known and collaborated with for almost all my uh, professional career. And uh, he sort of walks through the material space and finds really interesting stuff. I never know why he looks at these particular materials, but they turn out to be really interesting for us. And so we have sort of different motivations, chemistry and physics, uh, and the combination of those lead to interesting things. And that's actually part of what I'd also like to illustrate in this talk, um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the rich um, discoveries that can emerge when people from different um, areas of science actually interact with each other. Uh, now, the young people that were working on this is my postdoc, uh, Tong Chen, and my graduate student, uh, Ali Gazimi, um, and they've been doing all the neutron scattering experiments and very high magnetic field uh, measurements as well. Okay, so uh, we'll be examining uh, magnetism in, in what I call a MOT insulator. 
And I just want to start off with a little bit of an introduction to how we should think about magnetism in a MOT insulator. So first of all, what is a MOT insulator? So this is a material that has a uh, sort of as a thumbnail sketch. It has a half-filled electronic band. So if we neglect interactions between the electrons, it should be a metal. But actually, the electrons have strong uh, un un uh, unshielded, uh, unscreened uh, Coulomb repulsion. And as a result of that, you end up with kind of a gridlock situation in which no uh, actual charge transport can take place. Because every time you try to move an electron through the lattice, as I did here, uh, then actually you end up having a double occupancy on, on a site. And that costs a lot of energy in the system. So the electrons just kind of stay put uh, as a result of electron-electron repulsion. Um, now, this is an unusual type of insulating state because there is a spin degree of freedom associated with the odd number of electrons per site. And so you end up with having a very large entropy in the system, which would be R log 2 in this case if it was one electron per site. And all of this degeneracy eventually has to be lifted by quantum fluctuations. And these are actually virtual charge fluctuations uh, where electrons, even though there's no charge transport, then they do actually uh, kind of explore the surroundings. And that will lead to a lowering of their energy if we can have hopping take place. However, the hopping can only take place uh, if the electrons actually form uh, between sites that form a spin singlet. That's because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And so that means that the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the virtual charge fluctuations, in order for those to take place, we need to have singlet formation on near neighbor sites. And so if we then sort of integrate out the charge degrees of freedom, we end up with a spin Hamiltonian, which will describe how this spin space de degeneracy of R log 2 will eventually be lifted. And so all of the, uh, the quantum dynamics that remains is, is described in terms of these spin operators. And you can actually, after having integrated out the charge degrees of freedom, you end up with this kind of Hamiltonian. And you can, this is actually an equality that, that, that happens here. And you can see that, um, that this actually favors a singlet formation between uh, nearest neighbor sites. Um, the singlet formation actually promotes virtual hopping, hopping and is therefore uh, uh, energetically favorable. So this is simply a way to describe, uh, if you will, an antiferromagnetic character to the, um, to the interaction between spins in a magnetic dielectric. Uh, but I think it's useful to keep in mind that what we're really talking about are uh, virtual charge fluctuations giving rise to the magnetic interactions. And I should say that the dipole-dipole interactions, which are also going to be present, are very, very small in scale compared to these, uh, uh, com compared to these Coulomb driven uh, effects. By the way, please uh, you know, raise a hand, ask a question if there's something I, I can, uh, I can uh, help to clarify. But I'm going to jump straight into the actual materials. And I want to illustrate um, an interesting uh, thing that, that happens here, uh, which is that you can actually have a low dimensional magnetic material in a three dimensional crystal. It, it feels a little weird, um, but I, I want to show you a couple of examples. And I've shown you some data on these uh, kind of uh, materials. So the, the first material is lanthanum copper oxide, which is the parent compound to the copper oxide superconductors. We're not going to talk about superconductivity, um, but uh, we're interested in this, um, in, in the two-dimensional character of the magnetism in the system. And if you think back to this uh, interactions arising from virtual charge hopping or electron hopping, then what's really happened in this case is the lanthanide layer essentially is precluding electron tunneling between the layers. And you end up, therefore, with a quasi two-dimensional magnetic material. It's a fully three-dimensional chemi chemical substance. You can hold it in your hand. But the magnetism essentially uh, has to do with individual layers uh, interacting with each other. And that's a very interesting aspect of these materials, because when you go to lower dimensions, you enhance quantum fluctuations. And so chemistry can actually produce virtually kind of lower dimensional uh, magnetic materials. Now, here's another, oops, sorry, wow, that's this guy. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I got very much louder. OK, so, uh, so here's an uh, example of a one-dimensional material. This is a, um, we call it a, a co coordination polymer magnetic material. And you've got someone holding it here. It's in the form that we use it for neutron scattering experiments. So we actually, inside this package, 
are many, many crystals that we grew, and then we've aligned them with respect to each other to an accuracy of a couple of degrees. Uh, you know, we, a little bit of glue is holding them in place. I'm not showing that, but in our minds, all of this boils down to a macroscopic assembly of uh, lines of spin, so a, a one-dimensional magnetic material is in there. And we know exactly how it's oriented. Um, now, why is it one-dimensional? It's because electrons, in this case, can only hop through these uh, pyrazine rings. And so I only, so these are my magnetic uh, atoms, the copper atom, uh, but the, the hole, if you will, from the 3D9 configuration can only hop through this ring and so only can move in this direction, whereas it's quite difficult to have hopping take place between the chains and therefore we get very, very weak interactions. Not zero, there are always some degree of interactions, but really very weak interactions between the chains. So we can enjoy quasi one-dimensional magnetism. And I'll show you a couple of slides on, on what kind of magnetism results from this extreme low dimensional character that uh, is formed. And finally, this is a picture of the crystals that we will, the main part of the talk, uh, which is a triangular lattice Ising antiferromagnet. And here are the actual crystals, and we mounted them uh, with glue and this little assembly. And then, you know, they're actually crystals on both sides of these plates, and it's all stacked. This dimension is about 10 millimeters across. And we have, uh, I don't know, maybe 200 crystals are mounted in this thing, um, and all fairly well aligned. And that is necessary in order to build strength in the signal that, we are, that we're interested in. OK, uh, good. So we're going to use neutron scattering to probe the magnetism of all of these kinds of materials. Um, and uh, I, I'm you're going to be looking at a lot of neutron scattering data in this talk. The basic experiment is fairly straightforward. Uh, I am preparing an incident beam of neutrons, typically about 10 to the eighth neutrons per square centimeter per second, typically a monochromatic beam. It comes to my crystal, and I detect neutrons which have been scattered into some other energy and some other wave vector state. And I'm measuring basically the probability of scattering from initial conditions to final conditions. And I'm able to connect that to the probability of creating quasi-particles in the material, which have momentum that will make up uh, the difference in the incident and final energy and infinite in incident and final momentum. And so I can in that way trace out, if you will, the dispersion relation for the quasi-particle momentum and energy uh, using this method. Um, so uh, I'll maybe say a little bit about this later, but don't worry too much about that. This is an example of an instrument. That's an uh, instrument in the UK, actually. Um, this, is, this, this is a cryostat, which is about the size of, of a person. And then you can see the detector is really quite large, receiving all the neutrons scattered from the material. And back here is a, a moderator and a, a proton accelerator and a lot of very complicated um, equipment which needs to operate for us to generate the neutron beam. Um, here's another example of an instrument we're using. This is actually one I built myself, uh, the MAX instrument at the NIST Center for uh, Neutron Research. And it is built near a nuclear reactor, which is a 20 megawatt reactor uh, and various innovations have taken place to make this uh, really a leading instrument in the world for some of the experiments that we're, uh, that we're doing in this, um, in the, that I'm going to, uh, some of the experiments that I do, but actually I'm not using this uh, during this talk. Okay, so this was fairly brief introduction to neutron scattering. I wanted to advertise uh, the fact that I'm uh, going to have a, a small course while I'm here uh, during the summer, um, uh, during, during May really. Uh, these are the dates and it starts today so if this has been too fast and you'd like to learn more, you know, come back at 4 p.m. in, um, in this uh, uh, Sala Ruiz Mejia, and we're going to go through all of these things. It's going to be a fairly kind of broad introduction to neutron scattering, the idea being that there may be people here who would be able to use this technique for many other areas of material science than, uh, than this kind of quantum magnetism I'm talking about. So we're going to go through the whole thing and talk about the instrumentation um, many different types of experiments. Okay, all right, so then let me, uh, let me come, to the, uh, come to the topic here. Um, and I'm gonna first just illustrate what neutron scattering data tell us about each of the three compounds I, I briefly introduced. First one was lanthanum copper oxide. That's a two-dimensional antiferromagnet. Uh, and when you cool it down in order to promote uh, virtual charge fluctuations, there is the development of this so-called antiferromagnetic or nail order. Um, so 
sites which were previously indistinguishable in the paramagnetic phase now develop a net uh, magnetization which is staggered sort of from site to site through the lattice. And the way you notice that in neutron scattering is by the appearance of a new Bragg peak because the translational periodicity has now changed. This used to be a trans, uh, like a, um, a trans this used to be a, a brevet vector in the system, but now that takes you from a upspin to downspin. So I actually have to take all the step over there. And that implies that there's a new Bragg peak that develops. And by monitoring the temperature dependence of this Bragg peak, you actually probe the, uh, the staggered magnetization of the system. Uh, and this is really the only, or well, pretty much the only technique, but there are also some synchrotron uh, diffraction techniques that can do this. Um, the other thing you can do with neutrons is transfer energy and momentum, uh, and this would take place by creating spin wave excitations in the system. So these are uh, quantized um, uh, spin flips, uh, which move through the lattice uh, with defined momentum and uh, quasi-particle energy, and we can map the, uh, the energy of those magna and quasi-particles as a function of their wave vector transfer, of their, sorry, of their wave vector within the Brillouin zone. And this is the kind of dispersion relation you obtain. And from that, you can actually extract the strength of these exchange interactions between the different sites and the material. Um, so that's a pretty standard um, uh, uh, quasi-particle magna excitation. Now I want to, uh, I want to uh, explain that there are also materials where um, where the underlying quasi-particle cannot actually be created or annihilated by the scattering process. So it's actually forbidden by dipole selection rule. Um, so let's consider what would happen in that case. So that's the, that's the scattering process we're trying to do. And this is the standard one we've, talking about, we've talked about where I create a magnon and I uh, you know, keep track of momentum delivered and energy delivered to the magnon. That's a single particle process. But we can also have situations where the single particle process is truly forbidden and cannot take place. So the neutron is unable to create the underlying quasi-particle, and it can only create the quasi-particles in pairs, typically in even, uh, in even pairs. And so here's an example of a, a scattering process creating two quasi-particles. Uh, as a result of that, even though I control the, the net momentum delivered, then there's actually a range of different energies because I can apportion the momentum in different ways to those two quasi-particles. And so you end up with intensity which is sort of spread out in momentum energy space. There's pretty much, uh, it's, it's actually a fairly kind of bland, not, I mean, a little bit dull uh, spectrum, you know, a whole range of energies is covered as compared to here. But this is actually the one we're more interested in because that's the more exotic form of a quasi-particle which cannot be created individually in the process. And so I'm going to show in this talk another example or an example of generating this uh, continuum uh, of scattering. All right, so the first example um, will be uh, the one-dimensional chain. So that was the second compound I, I, I showed you, the one that the hand was holding <laughs> this box. This is the data that came out from these experiments. First, I'm showing you specific heat data. And very often, our work involves doing specific heat magnetization uh, measurements to really understand the, uh, the kind of the bulk magnetic properties. And then we carry on to neutron scattering. And here's shown a really curious uh, measurement of the ratio of specific heat to temperature versus temperature. And you'll see that in the limit of very low temperatures, there's a Sommerfeld constant in this material. So that you know this from metals. In metals, because of the presence of the Fermi surface, uh, there's actually a finite limit to C over T when you go to low temperatures. This material is actually an insulator, and yet it still has a, uh, has a, a Sommerfeld constant. So that's, that's a very weird thing, which actually is a result of having forced the magnetism down to one dimension. Uh, where there can be no phase transition, and instead you actually end up with a one-dimensional Fermi liquid uh, forming itself uh, in the chain. It's a very subtle thing, but uh, it has very specific consequences in neutron scattering, and those are shown here. So this is the wave vector and energy dependence of the scattering. It's quite an old measurement, actually, but uh, uh, what one finds is that for a given wave vector transfer, then there's actually a range of different energies uh, possible. Uh, so you, you have to know the resolution of the instrument. That is the resolution of the instrument. And then you'll notice that, these, that this is actually broader in energy than could be accounted for by a spin wave type excitation. And therefore we conclude, since this was done at really low temperatures, 
that this is a case uh, where there is a quasi-particle we cannot create uh, with a dipole transition, uh, and instead we have scattering as a multi-particle process. Now this model is sufficiently simple that one can actually fully calculate the two spin and contribution to the scattering. Uh, and this is, this is what it looks like. And, and the agreement between those two convinces us that this one-dimensional spin chain really forms a, um, a what we call a Luttinger liquid. OK, I briefly want to show you the magnetization curve for this material. So this is magnetization in, as a function of applied magnetic field. Uh, when we come up to around 20 Tesla, we fully saturated this, uh, the magnetization of, of, the, of the spin system. But you'll notice it's a completely smooth curve. That there's uh, some interesting behavior happening at the, at the highest field. But otherwise, a pretty kind of smooth curve. This will juxtapose or be quite different in the materials that I'm later going to, uh, going to show to you. Um, all right, now, what are these quasi-particles of the spin chain? Uh, I want to give you kind of a sense uh, of that. Um, so here, I'm, this is not an exact thing at all, but it's maybe something that helps just to think about it. I, I use it myself, even though I, I maybe shouldn't, because these are really quantum spin half. Yes. Uh, this, yeah, th this is a very subtle thing, actually, because T is really equals to zero. And so the reason for it uh, is really that um, it turns out that there's an extended critical phase in the spin half chain. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a very subtle thing, actually. In zero field, the spin half chain is actually in a critical state. It's as if it's sitting at a phase transition, which is at T equals to zero. Um, and when you apply the field, uh, you remain actually at a critical point. And it's, I'm not sure I can give a, a satisfactory explanation for that, um, but it, 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 because of it being the spin half chain, uh, there's actually a, an exact analytical framework where you, you can show that even in the presence of a high magnetic field, it still is in a critical state. That means that the system is actually what we call com compressible or it's able to actually have a continuously varying magnetization in response to a magnetic field. Um, and, and so then you get this kind of behavior. But it really is the, it really is the exception from the rule in the sense. Uh, and, and so it's a good, uh, it, 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 it's, um, you, you're going to see it very different in the other compounds. Yeah, so then, so the, the basic thing that one might, um, uh, to, to get a sense of these underlying, yes? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yeah. I was wondering if there's something equivalent here, and if it's possible to separate experimentally, transversally, what is it? Yeah, that's an excellent uh, point, and it is possible. Uh, what you need to do is to actually control the spin of the neutron so that in, in addition to probing, to keeping track of wave vector transfer and energy transfer, you also think about angular momentum transfer to the sample uh, because the neutron may come in with spin up and then flip in the process of interacting with the sample, then reaching the detector. And so we, this we can do, actually. We can, we can measure all of those four channels, so for up to up, up to down, and, and uh, down to down, et cetera. All of these could be combined and could be measured. Uh, now, the interesting thing about the, uh, the spin chain material and this copper-based magnet is that it really is an isotropic, it's, it's very close to an isotropic interaction that's present. And so in zero magnetic field, we expect the um, uh, response function to be completely spin space isotropic. Uh, once we apply a field, then we have a direction that we can distinguish against. And then we can separate out the transverse and longitudinal components. Um, I, we didn't do it in this experiment, actually. You could say, well, why didn't you do it? It's because it, it costs us about a factor of 20 in intensity. Uh, so so uh, we typically start off with the unpolarized experiment. And then sometimes we come back to do the polar. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the idea basically is that if I flip a spin from an antiferromagnetic state, so I'm thinking about the spins being more or less up and down, that, that's not an exact description of the system, but on short length scales, it kind of looks like that. If I flip a spin, that is a, um, a delta SC equals to one process because I went from half to minus a half or, or the other way around. Um, and so this, is, uh, this corresponds to creating a magnon, but this magnon is actually unstable um, by the action of the, of the underlying exchange Hamiltonian, it actually splits apart into two domain wall-like entities. 
Uh, so you'll, you'll actually see that this domain is different from this domain. Uh, this domain is the same as this domain. And it's kind of separated by these, uh, what we call spin-ons. And because this is a spin one particle and I have two of these, then these naturally should be spin half particles. Um, and they actually completely uh, can, can separate from each other and do not interact. They're asymptotically free degrees of freedom. Uh, but they cannot be created in a scattering process with a neutron just from angular momentum conservation because the neutron does have spin half and it brings it into the sample but then leaves with the spin half again. So it wouldn't work to kind of convert the neutron into a spin and then I, that would be a bad thing. So I, I need to have the neutron actually come out and therefore I cannot create them individually but I can do them in pairs. And that's basically why I end up with this multi-particle process for the spin half chain. So. Now the question is, can we have, this is what I'd call kind of part and parcel and really what we think of as a quantum magnetism to have topologically protected um, uh, kind of unique uh, underlying quasi-particles to appear in the material. But we're asking ourselves, can this also happen in higher dimensions? And it, it turns out that that is possible, uh, but to do so we have to, in a sense, use uh, the concept of frustration to suppress the drive towards this kind of long range ordered state that I described in the context of lanthanum copper oxide. And we need some device to avoid that kind of long range ordered state from occurring. And this device will be what we call frustrated magnetism. And I want to illustrate that by, uh, by going a little bit back historically um, and reminding you of this really, or maybe, uh, uh, I mean, to, to bring forward this uh, absolutely gorgeous work by Ansaga. Uh, long ago in the 40s, uh, where he explored a classical model of magnetism. So it, it's sort of the very natural and simple model one could develop um, in which the underlying magnetic moments are just scalar variables that can either be plus or minus one, and they have some kind of interaction. In this case, a ferromagnetic interaction, J is going to be a positive number in this case, so that uh, nearest neighbors would like to be sort of parallel to each other. Now you could say, well, you just you know, we said that magnetism is fundamentally a quantum phenomenon. In this case, um, it will turn out not to be possible to generate a material that truly realizes this model. There will always be quantum fluctuations that, um, that decorate it. And that, that will be our interest to follow the effects of the quantum fluctuations on these uh, Ising spin models. Uh, now, what Ansega was able to do was um, to actually, oh, something is happening here, sorry. I don't know what. Uh, excuse me, there we go. Yeah, what, what he was able to do uh, was actually to write down the, put, oh, to calculate the partition function for this uh, statistical physics problem, an absolutely incredible uh, accomplishment. From the partition function, you can calculate the specific heat uh, exactly. And so this is the computation by Onsaga in 1943. Uh, this sharp peak in the specific heat indicates a phase transition from a paramagnetic to a ferromagnetic phase. And it was the first time that someone could really, uh, you know, analytically and mathematically calculate the concept of a phase transition at a specific temperature, 2.269185 times the exchange constant. Uh, compared to that is a approximate computation by Vanier. Uh, he got fairly close to the right result. Um, um, now, uh, here's a very important point. I'm, I'm describing frustration by juxtaposition to something which is not frustrated. So this is specifically not a frustrated material. What I'm showing you here is the ferromagnetic arrangement, but actually this lattice is a so-called bipartite lattice. I can split it into two sublattices so that a red sublattice only has nearest neighbors which are blue. Of course, there's another neighbor here, but that's a second nearest neighbor. And so that kind of lattice, we call it a bipartite. It can be split up into two sublattices. When that happens, then an antiferromagnetic state very, very naturally fits onto this lattice. And in fact, I can completely map the ferromagnetic to the antiferromagnetic model um, uh, because of it being a bipartite lattice. So once you've solved the ferromagnet, you also have the antiferromagnet. And they're not different from each other at all. However, Vanier uh, looked at the triangular lattice problem. And that lattice doesn't fit to the antiferromagnetic interactions. Why? Because it isn't bipartite. I cannot split it up in the, in the way I indicated. I actually need three colors to be able to form this kind of uh, uh, color, this lattice, without near neighbors of the same color. And so that actually gives rise to a very important distinction between the ferromagnetic case and the antiferromagnetic case. 
If you do the ferromagnetic interactions, then Vanier now exactly was able to calculate again the partition function and then to show that there actually is a phase transition into the ferromagnetic state. Uh, the critical temperature is a little bit higher than for the square lattice because the coordination number is higher. Uh, but if you now go to the antiferromagnetic curve, you get totally different behavior. Uh, basically, as he says, because antiferromagnetism is, is, an, is on a non-fitting lattice. Um, um, so, so that is you know, really the encapsulation of frustration, what that is. It's a lattice which doesn't accommodate um, the interaction between the spins. Um, so it's really not possible simultaneously to satisfy all of the interactions. And you end up with a higher energy state. And actually, in this case, you end up with a state that has a finite entropy that Vanier was able to calculate. So there's actually a macroscopic ensemble of different ways that, excuse me, that you can arrange spins on the lattice which have the lowest energy state in this classical picture. And so what we're going to do is we will explore the effect of quantum fluctuations on this uh, degenerate manifold of states. And we know the quantum fluctuations have to be there uh, because the Ising model itself is kind of an unnatural classical description. Uh, and so it's, it is a fairly natural thing to look into. How does this finite entropy get resolved? OK, so then we have to get a little bit into let me first ask, how am I doing for time? I feel I'm... Uh, you have uh, about half, half an hour. Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay, so then I'll, I'll <laughs> relax a little bit more as well. I'm going too long. So now I want to talk about how do we realize this kind of Ising model at all? Because what I'd spoken about previously was a spin one half, like an isotropic spin one half degree of freedom. Now I need something which is uh, almost like a scalar degree of freedom, but with its, uh, with its inevitable quantum fluctuations. That turns out to be possible by using cobalt instead of copper. And that's because cobalt has a 3D7 electron configuration. Uh, and that builds in some orbital, um, uh, orbital angular momentum into the, into the uh, ground state. So let me, let me just say a few words about how this all proceeds. Um, so I'm thinking about just a cobalt O6 cluster. So I have the oxygen, and then I have my cobalt sitting at the center. And what are the relevant interactions? Well, they are the Coulomb um, uh, repulsion between, uh, between electrons. So they, they, they are all negatively charged, so there will be repulsion between them. There's also a repulsion between the electron and the neighboring ligands, so which is the oxygen. That we, that's what we call the crystalline electric field effect. And then there's a spin-orbit interaction between the spin and orbital angle momentum of, the, of those d electrons. OK, now the crystal field uh, interaction will, will actually lift the uh, degeneracy of the d orbital and uh, produce a low-lying triplet orbital state and a, and a higher-lying uh, doublet state, the interactions between the electrons actually favor the state of highest multiplicity. And that's what's written into the Hund's rules that kind of uh, encapsulates that. Uh, but really, it's in order to uh, have the lowest energy under the consideration of the electron repulsion uh, that, I've, that what becomes favored is the state of maximum multiplicity, which is also the state of maximum spin. So you take these uh, seven electrons and then put them in uh, in a way that will maximize the spin without violating the Pauli exclusion principle, and you end up with a half-filled EG orbital, and, uh, and this orbital, which has, uh, which has uh, a, missing, uh, a missing spin, uh, this half-filled orbital has no angle, orbital angle momentum associated with it, but the T2G level actually has a triplet orbital, has a threefold orbital degeneracy, which can be described as a pseudo, uh, a pseudo uh, spin one orbital degree of freedom. And so you have a spin three half and an orbital angle momentum one, and they get coupled by spin orbit uh, uh, interactions, which will split this otherwise 12 fold degeneracy and then select in the lowest energy uh, regime. Uh, the um, uh, a spin one half type degree of freedom. The splitting from the, from the doublet to the quartet is something in the order of 40 to 50 milli electron volts. So it's a fairly high energy scale and typically much higher than the exchange interaction. So we can think of everything as just happening in this, in this spin orbital doublet state. This really is a uh, effective spin one half degree of freedom, uh, but it carries an orbital angle momentum uh, to it, and therefore it has a very anisotropic G factor. And also, uh, depending on the spin state, the orbital configuration will actually be modified. 
And therefore, I will expect to have anisotropic exchange interactions, which is what we were looking for, because we wanted this Ising kind of model to come out. So now I'm going to put that Kobolo 6 degree of freedom on the lattice, and I'm going to use a polyanion, which is the SeO3 uh, anion. This is a two negative charged uh, polyanion. That becomes the uh, molecule that will allow electrons to, uh, to 3D, uh, 3D electrons to hop between different sites and will produce the exchange interactions. Uh, it also enforces the threefold rotation symmetry of the triangular lattice. Um, and so that's all the, the beautiful chemistry that makes all of this possible. Uh, there will then be some kind of a, what we call super exchange interactions as a result of the electron hopping. Um, and um, you might ask, well, how do you know how strong they are and how they behave, etc.? And basically, uh, there are some hand rules, the good enough Kanabori hand rules that we can use to get a sense of it. Um, but the strongest uh, tool we have is to use symmetry to constrain which kind of interactions could occur between different sites. And for example, because of there being a point of inversion in between nearest neighbor sites. This is a point of inversion. As a result of that, we cannot have this kind of term show up. So this, this, this is so-called DM interaction. It can have very strong if impacts on the magnetism. But that one, we can say, cannot exist at all uh, in this particular lattice. And so using these kinds of symmetry, you can arrive at this as a, as a fairly good approximation to the to the nature of the Hamiltonian that we would expect in this case. And basically, you've gotten an uh, interaction which is associated with the z component of the soda spin half degree of freedom, and then this transverse component, j transverse. And you've got your z-man term as well. And we can also estimate that jz is going to be much larger than j transverse. Um, so in fact, uh, if you were to completely neglect j transverse, then you would have the Ising model. So in effect, the decoration that we need on top of what Vanier was doing is this transverse term which will introduce quantum fluctuations and which will lift the degeneracy of this manifold of states that he obtained. I should say that you can use various quantum chemistry calculations to get fairly good control over these parameters. But in our work, we will simply measure them experimentally. Um, and we, we get very accurate measurements of those values. Um, all right, so now I'm going to then begin to look at the uh, magnetic properties of the materials. And of course, we do specific heat magnetization measurements. And what I'm showing you here is susceptibility as a function of temperature. And also, I have plotted inverse susceptibility as a function of temperature. We like to look at inverse susceptibility because the extrapolation uh, to, uh, the, to the um, uh, inverse susceptibility uh, to, to this horizontal axis that gives a measure of the strength of the interactions. And when that extrapolation goes to a negative temperature, it indicates an antiferromagnetic interaction. So just this measurement tells us, we, yes, we do have antiferromagnetic interactions as we, as we desired. Um, then we also go and apply a very large magnetic field. We go all the way up to 8 Tesla. We apply it along the c-axis, and we get this kind of saturation of the magnetization at a fairly low magnetic field. That's a little bit of a surprise to us, you know, that the energy scale is so, so small in order to achieve the saturation magnetization. So we were a bit curious as to whether this was the final kind of story. And so we, we went to Los Alamos National Lab to apply a much bigger field all the way up to 60 Tesla, which you can only do in pulses, actually. So these are, these are uh, quite uh, dramatic uh, single shot experiments. And you see that this is as far as we could reach in our own lab. But there's, at 20 Tesla, an increase in the magnetization all the way up to, this turns out to be 3.9 mu B per cobalt. Um, and so this is actually just exactly one third of that net magnetization. And so that's very different from what I showed for the spin chain. And in fact, in some ways, is, is a more natural behavior um, because the system has, uh, let's say, an incompressible state in some significant range of applied magnetic field, and then an additional incompressible state here. And then in between, uh, we've got this range uh, where the system is developing and changing its magnetization. Now, if you look at dm dB as a function of B, so it's the same data, I just take a derivative. And if you look very, very carefully, you can see something is not quite right about this guy here. And you take the derivative, there are actually two peaks. That was just you know, amazing to, to see that. It indicates that there is actually two different phase transitions. This peak is the final you know, coming up to the fully saturated system, but there's something taking place a little bit lower. And in between, there is a compressible phase, which we think is actually a super solid state. 
Now, we don't have neutron experiments up there because the field is a bit, a bit high, uh, but we're going to show that down here there also seems to be what we call a super solid state. So there actually appear to be two super solid states in this uh, material. Okay, now the experiments were done at the Oak Ridge National Lab, um, 1.7 megawatt pulse uh, proton facility, and I should say that uh, there's now a project to build a second target station, uh, which in 2032 or something like that will be available for us. Um, so, so it's a really exciting place to be doing uh, experimental physics. It's increased the uh, kind of the efficiency of our experiments by a factor of 10 to 100 over the past uh, decade. Yes? Yes? Uh, yeah, this was, this was all done, that's a good question. This was all done, uh, that was, I think this is one point, I think it's just one point, actually, yeah, I'm not, I have to check, it might actually be 0.3 Kelvin, I think it was a helium-3 fridge. Yeah. So it's really, really cold, yeah, yeah. We, oh yeah. You know, the thing never really goes into full out antiferromagnetic state. Um, and I'll show a little later that there's no peak in the specific heat as you cool down. Um, but there are some kind of um, developments of fairly long range correlations that we'll, that we'll look at. So, um, so we're using the facility, we're using this instrument, um, uh, which that looks very complicated. Uh, this, but all I want to really point out, I think, is uh, that actually this instrument can both measure scattering uh, into, a, into a horizontal plane, so the neutrons come in, uh, come in here, uh, and then they scatter into a big detector that's, that's sort of back here, but they can actually also uh, reach, it's a position sensor detector, so I keep track of the vertical uh, wave vector transfer as well. Um, okay, so we also will use this instrument, uh, which is in the UK, um, and that has even taller detectors and gives even broader access to wave vector transfer space. Um, so these are, these are <coughs> uh, really very impressive uh, instruments for, for me to use. When, when I, I don't want to be dating myself too much, but when I started sort of as a graduate student, we just had one detector, we we're kind of moving around the, the uh, thing, but now we really have tens of thousands of detectors and it's, it's really quite an exciting time to use this uh, technique. Okay, so now we begin to look at some data for this actual compound. And um, uh, so this is the triangle lattice material. And I'm showing you data here both at zero Tesla and at seven Tesla. And so I've subtracted low temperature minus high temperature. And you can see little additional peaks that appear there, there, there. There's kind of a hexagon of peaks here that are already there in zero field. Uh, the fact that these are really sharp in momentum space indicates a, a long correlation length in real space. So there's some kind of a fairly long correlations that have, uh, that have developed. Uh, these peaks occur at positions which are one third, one third wave vectors. So those are indicating that there's some kind of a translational symmetry breaking and that in fact, the area of the unit cell has expanded by a factor of three. So each unit cell is now containing three spins uh, as we cool down in zero magnetic field. And uh, we can actually follow the wave vector dependence in the vertical direction. That's what we're doing here. And that tells us something about the correlations between planes. Uh, and we find that it's actually very extended uh, lines of scattering. And uh, analyzing these kinds of data, we arrive at this picture of the ordered state, uh, which is one in which uh, there's a uh, one third of the spins are pointing just straight down. Uh, and and two thirds of the spins are pointing up but are tilted by some amount uh, in such a way that the whole unit forms a Y type entity and actually breaks the rotational symmetry. And we'll get back to this a little bit more, um, but you, you'll see that all of these uh, red spins are actually tilted to form a plane and that's a single plane that comes out of the, out of the board. I know this picture is a little bit difficult to look at because it's also shown a little bit in perspective. And so probably one should use about half an hour, but we only have a couple of minutes. So it's a little, it's a little tough like that. So, um, so that's the zero field state as we've inferred it. Uh, this is then in an applied field. Uh, and you'll see that what has happened here is that there was no peak there before, but that peak now appeared. That peak is actually at the gamma point 
That's the uniform point, and it indicates a uniform magnetization has developed in response to the applied magnetic field. That's pretty natural. You should expect you're applying a field. We are getting this, uh, this plateau magnetization, and that's revealed in diffraction experiments by this extra little peak. Now, if you look at the vertical component of wave vector transfer, you see that these peaks are all line type objects, meaning a two-dimensional magnetism. But these peaks are, are really three-dimensional Bragg peaks. That indicates a fully uh, three-dimensional magnetized state, which we should expect because we're applying a magnetic field to a three-dimensional crystal. So we, we think we understand those kinds of things. And by analyzing these data, we arrive at this description, uh, which is a description where we have uh, one-third of the spins are pointing down, say the blue spins, and two-thirds of the spins are pointing up, and they formed spontaneously this kind of honeycomb lattice. Uh, so this, we have to consider that as, as continuing on. Furthermore, you'll notice that the, the moment size is actually quite, uh, quite a bit smaller in the zero field state. And that indicates that there are considerable quantum fluctuations going on. These are really low temperature measurements at 0 0.1 Kelvin temperature. So this is a strongly quantum fluctuating state uh, that occurs in zero field. And those quantum fluctuations are suppressed as we apply field and drive it towards this collinear um, one third magnetized state. OK, so now I'm going to take a look at the excitations. Uh, and so now I'm sitting in zero magnetic field, and I'm monitoring the intensity of scattering as a function of wave vector transfer and energy transfer. These indexes are uh, symmetry labels for wave vectors within the first brilliant zone. Uh, and they're indicated actually here. Uh, but we, we shouldn't need to worry too much about those. But just think of this as a two-dimensional uh, uh, momentum uh, uh, variable that comes in this direction. And uh, the thing I want to point out is that you kind of see three bands of excitation. This band, here's a band, and then another band. They're quite weak up here, actually. And where this comes from is if you think entirely on the Ising limit, so where you have no fluctuations, then each spin sits in an exchange field from the six spins that surround it. And if you think of, of that as being more or less a, a, like a, a slowly fluctuating state of the remaining spins, then what I'm doing is that I'm, I'm flipping this spin in the presence of a ring of spins, which could be in any kind of configuration. Uh, if those spins add up to zero, which is the case here, then I'd have a, a zero energy excitation. So that would be this kind of thing. On the other hand, if I, if I go to this situation when I have one, two, three, four spins, which are up and two that are down, then that excitation would occur at an, ex, at an energy of approximately JZ, uh, uh, the JZ part of the, of the Hamiltonian. And on the other hand, if I have this kind of situation, then I get the JC equals to do. So what I'm seeing by the relative intensity of these is sort of what is the uh, composition of the surroundings for any given spin on average in the material. And the fact that you actually see these excitations up here is indicating that, in fact, I do have uh, you know, some kind of a, a mixture of, of, uh, of different configuration of spins because of the quantum fluctuations. OK. Uh, all right, so then I should also say that these are actually broadened in energy. This is broader than my resolution. And that broadening is on the scale of the transverse part of the exchange uh, constant. Uh, I also wanted to note that there's a certain wave vector dependence of the inelastic scattering, uh, which also indicates the antiferromagnetic character of the correlations. And, and it's a very important part of the story as well. OK, now I'm going to look at the very low energy part with higher resolution. And what you see is this kind of pattern here. And this, you know, you see it for the first time, but we, when we saw it for the first time, we're very excited about this. Why? Because these are actually broadened features. Even though I'm at really low temperatures and I'm, uh, I'm in a crystalline material, I have broad features in my excitation spectrum. And that indicates that I'm now in a situation again where I have some kind of a uh, protected quasi-particle that's not able to be created individually. And I have actually some kind of a pair process of scattering taking place. And we can see that as well as we follow the wave vector dependence um, of the intensity here. We see these kind of lines through reciprocal space also pointing to a continuum of scattering and some kind of a, some kind of a, um, of a um, non magnet type uh, excitation is actually present in the system. Um, now, a very important conclusion that we also reach is that there is a gapless spectrum of excitations at the K point. The K point is the wave vector for this uh, one third, one third wave vector of the tripled unit cell. Uh, the gapless character of the excitation 
That uh, actually um, indicates that we have broken rotational symmetry in the system. In order to have a gapless excitation, the Goldstone theorem, though that reaches into maybe not fully, uh, uh, fully familiar areas, but with the broken rotational symmetry, then actually the, there must be a gapless spectrum. So we, we take the conclusion the other way. So when we see a gapless excitation, it indicates a broken rotational symmetry. So we reach a conclusion about the ground state that it has a broken rotational symmetry. That's actually a little bit unusual when you think of an Ising system, because that's a system of spins that can mainly point up or down, but they're breaking the symmetry in the, uh, in the, um, uh, the, the threefold rotation symmetry of the, uh, of the triangular lattice. Um, OK, so let's take note of that. And then I want to look now, uh, if, if you remember the picture of the, of the spin chain, we had a magnon which broke into two spinons. Now I'm going to show you that in this system, we can kind of do the opposite. We can reassemble the spinons together to form a magnon. So this, I would consider something like a spinon continuum. I'm now going to apply a magnetic field, first half a Tesla, and then one Tesla, and I'm coming in towards the plateau phase. And as, as I reach the plateau phase, you have emerging out of this kind of morass of broad continuum, you have a really beautiful, uh, very sharp mode of excitation, uh, which is the, the magnet branch. So I've reassembled this, the, uh, the spin and like quasiparticles into a uh, full-blown magnet. Uh, and I can, I can then actually uh, analyze the dispersion relation for this magnet because in the plateau phase, I am able to create the underlying quasi-particle. And from that, I can now do conventional spin wave theory. And I can obtain very good measures of the ZZ component and the transverse component of the, uh, of the uh, spin Hamiltonian. And this puts us on a footing where we can really interact with theorists who may be able to directly calculate this uh, continuum of scattering that, we have, um, that we've observed. OK. So now I think I'm, I'm getting closer to, uh, to, um, <coughs> to uh, the, the end of it. And um, I, uh, let's see, I think I will, uh, right, I should maybe finish up in five minutes. Yeah, OK. So let, so, okay, so let me say, if, I think I'll say in the, in the final, uh, I'll say a few words about, um, I'll say a few words about the phase diagram of this, of this system. Uh, so here is, as, as I promises the specific heat versus temperature. In zero field, almost no features, just very, very broad features. In applied field, very sharp peaks occur, actually. And we can analyze the critical exponent for these peaks, and we find that it's very close to one third. That is the critical exponent for something called the three states POTS model. Um, and so that has to do with the uh, breaking of the sublattice symmetry. In the paramagnetic state, each side of the triangle lattice is equivalent. But in the plateau phase, two sides are up and one side is down. So I've made a choice which one should be the downside. And that choice requires a phase transition. And the critical exponent for that kind of phase transition in two dimensions is one third. And lo and behold, we find one third. So that was, that was quite, uh, quite interesting for us to see. Um, the, the other thing that, that you see quite nicely here is that the very prominent nature of this one third magnetization plateau uh, so uh, as I followed as a function of temperature, in the, for a range of different magnetic fields, the system kind of pulls itself into the one-third magnetization. If I put the field a bit too much, then the magnetization is reduced as I go into the ordered state. If the field is a bit too low, it is pulled up to that value. So that's the nature of this plateau phase. And if I then look at dmdt as a function of field and temperature, you essentially get this kind of phase diagram coming out. Um, and we identify the low field state as a super solid, also this as a super solid, and this is then the plateau phase, and here's the paramagnet. Now, you might ask, what, what do you mean by, uh, by a super solid? And let me say a few words about that. Um, so this has to do with the mapping of the spin system to a system of uh, interacting bosons. So here's the spin Hamiltonian. Uh, this can be mapped to uh, the boson crea uh, creation and annihilation operators um, in, this, in, the, in such a way that you end up with this as the mapped Hamiltonian. So it, it has a boson repulsion term, a boson hopping term, and the Zeeman term becomes the chemical potential for those bosons. Um, so essentially what it means is that an upspin is the presence of a boson, 
A downspin is the absence of a boson. A spin flip is the hopping of a boson through the lattice. So this, this is a typical thing that people like to do in, in spin systems to map it onto other models. And then you may, in some, in some cases, get a better kind of intuition from thinking about the boson model. And the way that this becomes a super solid is as follows. Um, and uh, I just want to, I want to say that we can analyze, as I, as I indicated, the diffraction data to, uh, to point towards this so-called so Y state, which has both a transverse component of magnetization and a longitudinal component of magnetization. And if you map what is the significance of these components, the, uh, the longitudinal component is related to a density-density uh, correlator, correlator for the bosons. The transverse part is related to this expectation value of boson creation and annihilation operator. And that is a so-called form of an off-diagonal long-range order, which is the superfluid content of the, of the state. So it's really the observation simultaneously of the, of the longitudinal and transverse component of the ordered state that in the boson language maps this to a supersolid. OK, with that, I want to, um, I want to conclude and say that we've, we've looked at the magnetism of this, uh, of this triangular lattice Ising model. The basic story was adding quantum fluctuations to a uh, degenerate manifold of states. Um, interesting correlated physics can be expected. And in this case, uh, that was actually a super solid state, um, as well as a, uh, uh, an extended plateau phase. Uh, we've obtained the spin Hamiltonian. Um, and we think that this is really now um, going to become a, a, a very a productive area for exploring the nature of the super, uh, super solid uh, state in kinetic matter. Um, and I, I want to, f as a final kind of summary of, of kind of what we, the kind of physics that we're doing here is that we're doing many body quantum physics with frustrated magnets. We have a variety of different model systems. Today I spoke about triangular lattice. We have Kagam lattice, pyrochlor lattices, uh, um, spin ladders, all sorts of different kinds of physics can come out uh, by uh, making connections to chemists. Um, with a lot of powerful experimental techniques, there are also some challenges. Uh, they are typically associated with disorder. Many of these materials are grown at some high temperature, and so there must be disorder. That's just inevitable by, by, um, by entropy, essentially. Um, and so this always becomes a relevant feature close to a critical state. Um, uh, and also, in some cases, there's a breakdown of this whole idea of a, of a rigid lattice um, uh, that eventually uh, comes in. Um, uh, and so those are, those are kind of challenges. But there are also interesting opportunities now. As I indicated, neutron scattering is really having, going through a kind of a rapid period of development. And so we can look in tremendous accuracy on some of these materials. There's also a lot of new um, methods to probe the uh, the strongly correlated physics of spin systems. Uh, that, and, and so the combination of these, I think, are, are going to really give some insight into, uh, into um, many-body quantum physics by looking at these kinds of magnets. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, dear Colin, for yeah. this quite uh, complete and uh, beautiful presentation. Thank you. And I think we are about the time, but maybe we, have, we, we can... Uh, a couple of questions, I don't know, in some, somewhere. Um, so I was just wondering, you were giving us this perspective on how to use neutrons to study the properties, yes. the magnetic properties of these materials. But I was wondering if there is like the other way around, if this uh, type of scattering of neutrons on these materials can be useful for like to produce neutrons of certain energies. I was wondering how much energy neutrons lose in this uh, uh, magnon uh, production and if that has been maybe uh, analyzed in terms of whether this could be used as a way to produce neutrons in certain energy range. Sure. Like no, I think that's a, that's a really interesting, uh, that's an interesting idea. And I, I, I think you're aware of the use of superfluid helium as a way to, to actually create, uh, high, you know, to, to actually stop the neutron within the scintillating material. And then you can measure the lifetime of the neutron decay. Uh, really, really beautiful experiments. Um, 
And so, so I, I can understand where this uh, uh, idea could kind of come from. And uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I've heard about such a thing, but it seems quite natural that one should be able to do that. Um, you know, if the roton is not at the right energy, uh, you like to try another energy. In principle, one could do it. But of course, you'll end up with a neutron within a, a solid. Helium is a, such a lovely material, so I, it's, that's a little bit of a question of whether you could find a material which would have the right excitation energy and where the nuclei would not be absorbing neutrons. Um, some nuclei, I mean, most nu well, some nuclei have neutron absorption, so they would not be good ones uh, to have it. Now, the, the other thing I, I'd say is that um, we do use magnetic materials to, to f let's say, to shape and to, to modify the neutron beam. And I think there's probably a lot more than one could think about in that context. For example, we sometimes use ferromagnetic materials um, uh, to select a specific spin state of the neutron. Uh, and so this you do by, uh, by interference between nuclear and magnetic diffraction. And you can create a really clean uh, polarized neutron beam. Uh, so this this kind of um, methodology to shape the beam could could be used as uh, as well. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are ideas we could think of. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. No. Well, if there is no more question, thank okay. you very much. And remember, I'm, I'm sitting over there, and I hope uh, you know, just come by if there's something we can I, I should uh, expound on a bit more. Yes, of course. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.